All right, so last talk before the break. Try to make it shorter this time. Um, yes, uh, so you might remind me I'm the guy who's working at the very remote place in France. Um, and that is here a slide of just reminding you that um, there are different forms of central nuclear and multi-tubular myopathy. These are the very classical forms associated with mutations in MTM1, BIN1, and Dynamy2. But as Alan was showing, there is also cases with titan mutations or Rindine receptor or SPEG. And this is just to remind you that we are working real on all aspects um, of, of central nuclear and multi-tubular myopathy in the lab. And here I will, um, in this talk, um, just present a therapy that we have developed in the lab. So just a few words about therapies in general. So basically we can say that there are three different types of therapies. So the first one is the pharmacological therapy. So basically there are just some chemical compounds that you take in. And as long as you take in these chemical compounds that are targeting an organ or a tissue, everything is fine. And people are working on this as Hernan, for example, was presenting. Then there is also what we call a cell therapy. So the, uh, the idea behind the cell therapy is that there are six cells, so the muscle cells do not work well, and people are trying to replace the six cells by healthy cells. There are some promising results um, and promising research that is ongoing, although there are still some major issues that we can discuss later on. And then there are some people also here uh, present that are working on gene or protein replacement. This is, for example, for example gene therapy that is um, done by Anna and also uh, developed then also by Odentis. Or there is also an enzyme replacement therapy um, that will be proposed by Valerian. And so in our lab, we have um, developed a kind of new concept of a therapy that we call the cross therapy. And that doesn't really fit in this classical, classical approaches of, of therapies. So what is the idea behind? So in the lab, we found out that there seemed to be a pretty important balance between MTM1 and Dynamy2 that is essential for normal muscle function. And we found out that in patients with myotubular myopathy, there is um, severely reduced MTM1. So there is an imbalance between MTM1 and Dynamy2. And in those patients, we even see that the Dynamy2 seem to be more active. So there is a clear imbalance, and now the classical approach for therapy would be to target MTM1. But we thought that we could try something else. We could perhaps try to target Dynamin 2 and to reduce Dynamin 2 in order to rebalance the equilibrium between BIN1 and Dynamin 2. So this is what we call a cross-therapy. Okay, so how did we do this now in the mice? So we had the mouse model for myotubular myopathy, and we crossed this mouse model with another mouse that has only half of Dynamin 2. So these mice are doing absolutely fine, so it seems to be okay to have only 50% of Dynamin 2. Now we crossed these mice and we obtained mice that have no myotubularian, so just at the patients with myotubular myopathy, and only half of Dynamin 2. Okay, we're crossing them and then we obtain the mice. And this is here a movie that I will show you. So in this cage, we have three mice. There is one normal one, one without myotubularian, and one without tubular myotubularian and only half of dynamin 2. Okay, and then I will ask you, this is a quiz, to tell me which is which. Okay, three mice. So there is... Obviously one that is not running around a lot. So you might imagine that this is the mouse without myotubularian, so the myotubular myopathy mouse. But the two other ones look very similar, right? So which is which? Which is the normal mouse and which is the one that has only half of Dynamy 2 and no myotubularian? Hard to see the difference, right? We will see this again, this movie. And so on the right side, we have now the normal mouse. On the top, we have the myotubular myopathy mouse, and on the left, we have the myotubular myopathy mouse, where we reduce dynamin 2 by half, and we see this movie now again. And then you will see that this mouse here, this buddy, is walking pretty well. He's doing just as good as the normal mouse, just by reducing dynamin 2, although this mouse should be sick, but it's obviously not. But of course, just Walking around in a cage is not really enough proof. And that's why we thought it would be a great idea to go into the gym with the mice. <laughs> and to make them make some chin-ups. That's a great idea. So this is your mouse 
that we ask this mouse to do some chin-ups. Oh, oh, no, no, but he's doing well, no worries. So let's try again, a few chin-ups. Uh, come on, buddy. Uh, almost, almost one, if you can try to count. Okay, one more try. One, yeah, yeah, two, three. Okay, okay, well, not very good, but this is now here another mouse where we did the same thing, so to do some chin-ups with this mouse. Okay, he's pretty lazy, we have to push him a bit. Okay, one, two, three, wow, lots of chin-ups, very good. Yeah, pretty good. Ah, oh, he's using his feet, that's not the rules. So we're putting this back. Okay, using his feet again. Okay, this mouse is doing pretty well, right? He's, he's not, that, this is what we call a string test. And so the, 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 the mouse is not, is not um, falling down. So then there is also another test that we love a lot. So this is a climbing test. We call it this the hanging test. So we put the mice on the lid of the cage and then we turn the, the, the lid around to see if they are able to climb upside down. And this is here the first mouse again that is trying to climb upside down. So we turn the lid around and this mouse is, yeah, not doing very well. So let's come, let's, we, we try again. Okay, again, we can take the mice, the mouse, then we turn the lid around and we see how well the mouse is climbing upside down. Well, not so well. And then we have here again the second mouse. Um, and basically, I cannot really show you the whole video because it takes 10 or 15 minutes because this mouse is just climbing upside down the whole time without falling down. And now the question is, these are two different mice. One is the myotubular myopathy mouse, and the other one is the myotubular myopathy mouse where we reduce dynamic 2. So which is which? Okay, yeah, and now of course you know very well who, which is which. So the one on the left one was the myotubular myopathy mouse, which was not very good in the chin-ups. And on the right side, it was the myotubular myopathy mouse where we reduced dynamic 2 by half. And this mouse is doing pretty well. But of course, these are just a few movies. And as we are scientists, we love statistics. And that's why I will show you now some statistics and things that we can measure. So we can measure, for example, the force of these mice. And this is here the force of the normal mouse. So that is here the full force of the normal mouse. And that is here the force of the myotubular myopathy mouse. So of course, much less. And now let's see how the forces of the myotubular myopathy mouse were reduced dynamic two. Okay, it's developing pretty good. Actually, wow, pretty good, almost as good as the normal mouse. So I would say this is probably not enough to do Olympics, but for having a normal life, this is absolutely sufficient. Talking about the life, something that we can also measure is the survival of the mice, of the life expectancy. So um, the life expectancy of the normal mouse in the lab is approximately two years. So we just look for the first year. So this is here the survival of the normal mice. So after one year, we still have 100% of the mice. They all survive. And this is here the survival rate of the myotubular myopathy mice. So basically, after three months, we have only very few left. After four to five months, uh, we have no mouse with myotubular myopathy left. And now let's see the survival of the myotubular myopathy mice where we reduce dynamic two by half. Okay, after five, six months, still everybody's there. Okay, nine months, wow, 11 months, 10 months, 11, 12. All mice survive, all. And this is only the first year. I could show you even the second year, it's the same. We do not lose a single mouse. They have an absolutely normal life expectancy. So to sum up this pretty complex story is that we found out that there is an imbalance in myotubular myopathy between MTM1 and Dynamin2. And instead of targeting MTM1, we had the idea to target Dynamin2, to reduce Dynamin2. And the result is something that you saw, is that the mice, the myotubular myopathy mice, were reduced Dynamin2 by half, have a normal lifespan and they are almost as strong as normal mice. And now the very interesting thing about it is that we even found out that there is a very similar imbalance in central nuclear myopathy between Dynamin 2 and MTM1. And that's why we thought that our therapy could be an approach that is targeting myotubular myopathy and central nuclear myopathy. And that it could be combined with any other therapy that is on the market or will be on the market soon, which would make it a pretty interesting approach. 
So how can we do this now? Because in the mice, we are reducing dynamin 2 genetically by crossing the mice. We cannot really do this with the patients, cross them and reduce dynamin 2 genetically. So we have to find another way to reduce dynamin 2 in the patients with myotubular and centrinuclear myopathy. And to explain you how we are doing this, we have to go a few steps back and I have to explain you again what a gene and what a chromosome is. So a gene is a part of a chromosome. And a gene and a chromosome have no real activity in the cells. They're not doing anything in the cell. Basically, they're just carrying information. So um, a chromosome or DNA is just like a manual, for example, to build a car, because a manual is not driving, but it carries the information to, to build something that is driving. And the information that is on the DNA and on the chromosome um, is to build something that is called a protein. And the protein, if you want, is like a car. This is, by the way, my car, old French car. <laughs> so um, the manual itself is not driving, but the car is driving. Now, reducing dynamin 2 could be done in two different ways. So the first way would be to block dynamin 2 at the genetic level. So somehow we have to try to find a possibility to block the manual so that less cars are produced. Or, on the other side, we could also try to block the car itself from driving too fast. And this is currently what we're doing in the lab. So we are trying different drugs that are blocking the car. And those drugs are known, drugs exist that block dynamin 2. And currently we are testing them in the Petri dish to see if they are really able to slow down dynamin 2 and to treat patients with myotubular and centrinuclear myopathy to work as well as it, as it, as it works in the mice. And so, um, once that we have a hit, and we are currently working on this, when we have a hit, we have to validate this on animal models. And the very good thing about myotubular and centrinuclear myopathy is that there are different animal models that exist, and we have to validate on our drugs, our drugs that we will discover, on any of these animal models. As for example, here the zebrafish from Jim, or the two different mouse models, or this very famous dog model that I discovered a couple of years ago. And also for centrinuclear myopathy, we also have different, different animal models. As for example, here again a zebrafish, or we have a mouse model, or also another dog that I discovered also a couple of years ago. So the take-home message um, for this talk is that the cross therapy seems to work extremely well and it has the potential to treat all forms of myotubular and centrinuclear myopathy and it could be combined with other therapies that would be proposed by other teams, which makes it a very, very strong therapy with a very strong potential. So thank you very much. So this is here the team and mainly the people that are working in it. And here I have to cite Belinda, who is the brain behind this, who had this idea. She's probably the smartest person I've ever met. And we are so happy that we have Belinda in our team. And this is the people that, oh, sorry, that work um, a lot with Belinda, especially Ishem, um, Joss, of course, Valentina, uh, and uh, Susie. So thank you very much. Thank you.